Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be back here at the Foreign Press Center in New York. Um, I have to say, this is always the highlight of my week, even if it comes at the end as it does, and I make my escape from New York soon after. Um, I will uh, apologize for sitting at the table today. Uh, as you can see from my attractive piece of hardware, uh, I recently had some surgery, so I'm a little bit slower getting around. Um, unfortunately, that also forced me into a situation of slightly fewer meetings this week than I uh, sometimes have because, as you know from New York during the UNGA, if you can't run from one meeting to another, you miss some. Um, but it has been a busy week nonetheless, and I've tried to keep up uh, with the secretary, with the deputy secretary, with the undersecretary, with the president, with the vice president, and, and everybody else who's here this week, either for all or part of it. Um, one of the things I wanted to start out with is, I think, you know, as you've seen from this particular UN General Assembly, there were a series of extremely high-profile global events, right? Uh, the president stayed uh, from Tuesday to Thursday, which is a pretty long time for a U.S. president to stay in New York at the General Assembly because there were so many major global meetings, whether you're talking about the climate summit uh, or um, his presiding over the Security Council to talk about foreign fighters after the Secretary led the Security Council in discussion of Iraq the Friday before, um, or conversations that were being held in our Global Counterterrorism Forum, uh, or uh, the meeting that was held by the Secretary General on Ebola, or even today's, you know, Washington-based conversation on global health security, which talk, which we'll talk much more about uh, Ebola, but also a broader conversation about health security uh, worldwide. Every one of those, uh, and I actually should not fail to mention uh, the indigenous peoples. Uh, conversation and, and uh, movement on that issue early in the week. Every one of those conversations not only involved, uh, but really had a fairly prominent role uh, for countries and leaders in this hemisphere. And I don't think that's always what we think of when we think of these crises, uh, but it's very much true. And I think we really need to remember that, whether it is um, GRULAC members of the Security Council involved in those discussions or um, the mobilization of every country in the world to work on Ebola, um, whether it is sending uh, assistance to Africa to help fight uh, Ebola, or readying themselves and their own countries to be sure that they're vigilant at home. Um, obviously, the questions of indigenous peoples and climate is one in which this hemisphere has really taken a lead and in fact is feeling effects of climate change as you look at small island states in the Caribbean um, or you look at COP, which will be held in Lima in December, the Conference of Parties, the uh, latest round, uh, or Mexico, which was the first developing country to commit to targets a couple of years back. So I think what sometimes gets lost in uh, the tick-tock or the count of how many meetings have been held at high levels on a bilateral level uh, is the engagement of Western Hemisphere countries on every one of these global issues and interaction with the President, with the Vice President, with the Secretary of State. Um, today, for example, the Vice President will be holding an event on peacekeeping operations uh, because what we see globally is an increase in demand for peacekeeping operations and a real need uh, for more countries to step up, not only to provide peacekeeping forces, uh, but also, frankly, to share in the burden of the cost. Um, and you will see the Western Hemisphere represented in that event, uh, including countries that have not necessarily participated before. You all heard President Peña Nieto in his speech in front of the General Assembly talk really for the first time publicly about moving towards peacekeeping operations for Mexico. So. So I just want to make sure that I, I talk about at the top um, the very real engagement with us and with the world community of countries in this hemisphere. Obviously also seeing um, uh, Ambassador John Ash or President John Ash stepping down as President of the General Assembly from the Caribbean. So 
Um, we had a series of meetings at different levels. The Secretary met with, Caribbean, uh, with Central American foreign ministers from Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, as well as undersecretaries from Mexico to talk about the issue of unaccompanied children, which we've been discussing on a regular basis since, obviously, uh, earlier in the spring. Um, but to follow up on that conversation and really take it further uh, to talk about next steps, as we have seen those numbers decline uh, between June and August, um, I think everybody recognizes that although some of the decline may be attributable, and it's really too early to say, to some of the activities we undertook, whether public relations campaigns uh, to outline the dangers of this and the truth about whether or not people would be eligible uh, for immigration adjustment in the United States, or um, the efforts that have been made against smugglers who are exploiting children and families in those countries, uh, whether it's seasonal is, is really unclear. Uh, but we do know that the numbers are down markedly, and we want to make sure that we use this period of time when those numbers may have gone down to ensure that we're really getting at some of these root causes, that we're focusing on how we can work even better together. And so the Secretary had an excellent conversation with the foreign ministers and with the Mexican undersecretaries, and the foreign ministers did present the United States with a plan, which you may have heard about, which we will be discussing further with them. Um, Finally, I want to say that on some of the issues that have been on the uh, sort of the, the highest headlines these days, issues of ISIL or ISIS, um, I do want to say that I think people find that extremely um, distant from, from countries in this hemisphere. Happily, things like the extremely erroneous uh, report of, you know, ISIL plots uh, on our border or, you know, moving towards El Paso were just that. They were, you know, erroneous. Um, but the fact of the matter is cooperation with countries in this hemisphere, especially those on our borders, is fundamental uh, to part of our efforts uh, to combat that threat, threats from terrorist group, be they ISIL or others. Our cooperation has steadily increased in this hemisphere on that kind of counterterrorism effort. But I also want to highlight that the issue of foreign fighters is not something completely foreign to this hemisphere. Um, we know that we all have more we can do to combat that issue, whether it's in the United States uh, or whether it's in other countries of the hemisphere. Uh, it is not unheard of. It is not unknown. Um, and we need to continue to focus on that issue as well as the financing issue uh, as part of this comprehensive effort that the United States is making. So uh, just to underscore again, as I said, that um, the top issues of the day very much engage uh, the senior leadership of the United States government with senior leaders in this hemisphere. So let me stop there and start questions. Good morning. Um, okay. Thank you very much for doing this uh, briefing, and I wish you a prompt recovery. Um, I wanted to ask you two questions in two different countries. First one is uh, President Cristina Kirchner from Argentina made some critics on U.S. policy at the Security Council, and um, there's this issue of the Argentina's litigation against some investors from the United States that uh, U.S. court might declare the country in contempt on Monday. So I was hoping if you could give me an assessment of where is the, the bilateral relationship between the United States and Argentina today after all these uh, events. Um, the second one is about Mexico. Um, what is the impact for Mexico's uh, position in the global stage of Peña Nieto's decision of participating in uh, peacekeeping operations? Thank you. Okay, thanks. I think I, uh, let me take the Argentina question first. Um, Certainly, I'm not, I'm not going to comment on the litigation, but I think on the, the situation in the bilateral relationship, we, we remain um, interested and engaged in areas of bilateral cooperation where we can move forward. Obviously, this is a very tough issue um, uh, for Argentina, and we are hoping uh, that it can be resolved in a way that Argentina can return to the international uh, financial community 
uh, that Argentina can begin to grow and be productive again. Argentina is obviously a very uh, rich country in resources, um, and we think that having Argentina be back as a full member of the international financial community is good for Argentina and, and the relationship with all of the countries of the world. So obviously we hope that that will be uh, the end result at some point. But I think in terms of the bilateral relationship, we want to try and engage in a positive way with Argentina, whether that is on energy cooperation, where we have had good cooperation, continuing to try and work on nonproliferation issues where Argentina has been an ally, um, or on things like combating terrorism where Argentina has particular obvious experience, unfortunately. Um, it is a tough period right now, um, but we continue to hope that we can have a positive relationship, um, and we don't believe uh, that this is an issue between our two governments. It is an issue for um, the courts to decide, and it should not be one that should uh, be affecting the bilateral relationship. Uh, on the Mexican case, um, you know, I think obviously we welcome President Peña Nieto's announcement. Um, we believe that Mexico can contribute a great deal uh, to international peacekeeping efforts, but we also respect the fact that Mexico has a process that it needs to go through in deciding exactly how and when uh, they will participate in those operations as the President laid out. So we look forward to that process and to welcoming Mexico to operations of UN peacekeeping when and where uh, they deem it appropriate. But we think they have a great deal to offer. y las relaciones internacionales y desde luego Leopoldo López y su detención y también nos gustaría saber un poco más acerca de los acuerdos que se están trabajando con los países de Centroamérica eh, como mencionaba Honduras, Guatemala y El Salvador para el, la situación de los menores que llegan a los Estados Unidos sin compañía y para terminar si pudiera hacer un pequeño comentario en cuanto a los terroristas sí. los terroristas en, extranjeros en español Básicamente que nos contara lo que mencionaba en la conferencia de prensa de los terroristas extranjeros, solamente un poquito en español. Ah, bueno, este, bueno, primero, eh, el presidente en, en su discurso ha mencionado muchos casos. Eh, esos fueron casos, este, eh, casos importantes como símbolos, como este, ejemplos, eh, en donde queremos nosotros ver eh, un proceso abierto, transparente, rápido, y un proceso donde este, las personas tienen todos los derechos que merecen en este, el derecho internacional y este, las garantías que tienen sistemas nacionales este, o internacionales. Y hemos tenido preocupaciones en el caso de Leopoldo López y hemos dicho varias veces que queremos este, asegurar que tiene un proceso este, justo Um, y tenemos preocupaciones todavía. Eso fue eh, eh, la razón que mencionó el presidente de ese caso. Pero eso no significa que no tenemos preocupaciones en otros casos en Venezuela eh, y que todavía tenemos esas preocupaciones. Y este, como, como eh, parte de, de las Naciones Unidas y de la OEA, tiene responsabilidades este, bajo estas... Este, eh, tratados internacionales y, y compromisos parte de, de esas, esas organizaciones. Eh, también en el, el caso de la, la reunión y, y las instituciones con los este, países de América Central, eh, eso es un proceso con ellos este, de profundizar los esfuerzos este, en combatir, especialmente en combatir el, el crimen, eh, de los grupos este, criminales organizados que están explotando no solamente a esos niños, si, sino también a las familias. Porque tenemos que, que recordar que 
son los, las familias que están pagando a esos grupos criminales para este, llevar sus niños a los Estados Unidos. Y es una, es una tragedia humana. Tenemos que subrayar, y quiero subrayar, también voy a hacerlo en inglés también, que es una tragedia humana al fondo. Eh, y, y ellos están utilizando la tragedia, la pobreza eh, de esas personas o, o la violencia en, en varios este, lugares en América Central, eh, ganar fondos este, y, 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 y enriquecer ellos este, con, ese, con ese camino a los Estados Unidos, un camino muy peligroso para los niños. Eh, al fin, en los Estados Unidos, ellos no pueden aprovechar las leyes, por ejemplo, de DACA para niños que, que fueron llevados a los Estados Unidos como niños, como pequeños, este, bajo de, de 16 años de edad. Eso no fueron este, para esos tipos de, de personas que han entrado recién. Tiene una fecha este, eh, fija en la ley. Y, este, y realmente es una tragedia este, que esos grupos criminales están explotando a esas personas. Y tenemos todos... La, los gobiernos de, de la región y nosotros y México juntos eh, combatir a eso, ese flagelo. Y, este, y yo creo que hemos demostrado que podemos trabajar juntos durante el, el crisis y ahora tenemos que profundizar la cooperación no solamente en materia del, del, de la crisis, sino también en los raíces de los problemas, porque no podemos... Este, olvidar que esas son las, las, las razones que ellos vienen y este, si no queremos repetir esa crisis, tenemos que continuar trabajando. Y al final, este, sí tenemos que combatir este, los grupos terroristas eh, en cualquier parte del mundo, aunque no tenemos esos grupos, por suerte, en, en el hemisferio occidental, sí tenemos que guardar y, y ser vigilantes eh, en eh, asegurar que ellos no están utilizando el terreno ni los, este, los, eh, los sistemas bancarios, eh, ni tampoco están este, eh, quizás este, eh, permitiendo a los este, combatientes este, extranjeros eh, ir a este, las batallas o los lugares en el Medio Oriente Así que hay un rol, un papel para todos los países, todos los gobiernos, los ciudadanos de todos los países del hemisferio incluso. Gracias. And let me just underscore in English what I said, which really didn't come out in, in my opening remarks on the unaccompanied children issue. The secretary and his counterparts underscored, and we continue to underscore, this is a human tragedy. It is not just a policy and a political and an economic problem. Um, And we have to keep that in mind. These are children and these are families. We'll go now to Washington. Sonia Schott, please. Uh, hi. hi, how are you? Uh, Sonia Schott with Diario Las Americas. Uh, since you mentioned Leopoldo Lopez, I would like to know, it is, uh, can we consider the era of uh, the U.S. wanting to improve dialogue with the Venezuelan government is over? since President uh, Obama back uh, the, lead, the opposition leader, Leopoldo Lopez. Uh, the second one is also related is, um, what a specific uh, role do you have in mind for Latin America? And I would like to know, did you ask Colombia uh, in order to place something specific uh, to, to fight uh, ISIS uh, or uh, to help the U.S. fight ISIS in some ways? I don't know. And on the other hand, what happened to the countries who are not that close to the U.S. in the region? Are you afraid that ISIS could see a window of opportunity there? Thank you. Thanks, Sonia. Let me start out by saying, when the president mentions cases, as he did with that of Leopoldo Lopez, in, in any of these cases, the president is talking about upholding basic standards of human rights and due process. He is not and never has been making a political statement of support for a political agenda. So it is not accurate to say he is backing Leopoldo Lopez as an opposition leader. I would not criticize Leopoldo Lopez, nor would the president as an opposition leader under no circumstances. 
but we surely would support and continue to Leopoldo Lopez or the two opposition mayors who are still in prison or any other Venezuelan citizen's right to peaceful protest. And that is what the president is talking about. He's not endorsing a political agenda. He is endorsing freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, the right to peaceful protest, the right to transparent due process if there is a criminal or, or a, a, a judicial process, um, the right to have witnesses on your behalf in your trial. This is what the president is talking about. He's talking about a system of judicial and democratic process that should be upheld. And that, I think, is crucial. So it, to set this up as the era of wanting uh, an improved relationship with Venezuela and having chosen a particular uh, opposition leader to back would be a misinterpretation of the president's words. We have always said and will continue to say that we strongly believe that every Venezuelan citizen should have the right to those freedoms as I've just outlined, be they from the government side or the opposition side. Um, and that is what we are supporting. Um, we obviously have uh, conversations with the Venezuelan government. We continue to have those conversations on, on practical matters. We do not see eye to eye on many issues. But we would continue to hope that we might have an improved relationship with the Venezuelan government, as we've said. That is difficult at times, and we will continue, as we have told the Venezuelan government, to speak out on issues of principle when we believe that's necessary. Uh, the last question you may, said was about uh, the foreign fighters, I think, and whether or not... In the fight, I so I think, I, I think basically what the president and the secretary um, in their meetings with leaders from this part of the world are asking is exactly the same as they are asking of other governments and leaders around the world, which is support for the comprehensive approach to the fight against ISIL, which is, and I think this is one of the things we have to be a little bit careful of. Obviously, the media focuses on who may be supporting the fight in air power. Um, but we have to remind ourselves that that is part of a comprehensive approach that includes the fight against foreign fighters, the fight against financial resources going to ISIS or ISIL, the humanitarian assistance that's necessary for the millions who are fleeing their homes as a result of ISIL. All of those are part of the fight against ISIL. And in some of those areas, there is clearly a role for all governments of the world, including those in this hemisphere. So that is what he is asking of all countries, including uh, allies and folks we may not be uh, as close to in this hemisphere. Thank you. Lucia. Um, hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about the summit of the Americas, uh, Panama, the, oh, sorry. I'm Lucia Leal with EFE. Um, uh, the, the Vice President of Panama recently tra traveled to Cuba, Cuba and stated uh, her, Panama's intention to invite them to the summit. I wanted to know if the United States is still opposed to Cuba uh, attending. And also, uh, Mexico and France have uh, argued uh, in favor of limiting the power of veto, veto in the United States Security Council in in some instances, I wanted to know what's the U.S. position on that. Thank you. Okay. Um, on the Summit of the Americas, I think we've been pretty clear in our position on the summit, which is that obviously Panama is the host country for the summit, um, and as the host country, they will make the decisions on invitations to that summit. Um, I think the invitations in a formal sense have not yet been made, but we obviously have seen the same commentary that you have. And, you know, the, the fact of the matter is we have said from the start that we look forward uh, to a summit uh, that can include a, a, a democratic Cuba at the table, 
Um, we also have said that the summit process, uh, ever since Quebec in 2001, has made a commitment to democracy, and we think that's an important part of the summit process. But the decision about invitations is not the hours to make, and obviously um, there's been no invitations formally issued to uh, the United States and, and other countries, and so, you know, there is no acceptance or, or rejection yet uh, called for or made. Um, on the question of the UN Security Council, I had not heard those comments that you referred to by Mexico, but I think you can probably understand that the United States would probably not support a, a reduction or a restriction in its veto power in the Security Council, but it's not, it's not something that I had actually heard, so I, I can't really reflect on the specific comments. New York and then go to DC. Um, oh, one, one here. <laughs> Thank you, Silvia Yuso with El Pais newspaper. I have a couple of precisiones uh, on what you've been talking on the on the summit of the Americas. Uh, one thing is what Panama might do, but in case Panama finally invites mm -hmm. everybody, mm -hmm. is there a chance that the U.S. might refuse going? Would that be possibility that the U.S. would wage, would the, if Cuba goes, would the U.S. not go? On ISIL and the fight for, um, I mean, the, 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 what everybody can do and the hype, are there concrete things that the U.S. might ask? I mean, like you said, there's like financial part. Are this, is there, it's already been talked about something concrete that the Latin American countries might do. And there's also the, 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 the issue that some countries have a very good relationship with uh, Bashar Assad. I mean, uh, President Maduro the other day on his speech mentioned that it was him who had led the fight against those terrorists. So is there any problem with that or might that be an advantage that there's a way to communicate with the Assad regime? And the last very question, with the migration, Central American migration plans, is there any money on the table? Because uh, the, the Latin Americans had asked for some money, and the U.S., when the Congress didn't approve the plans of the president, I mean, there was this 300 million that have disappeared of the conversation. Could that be picked up some, somehow again? Okay. Um, on the first one, again, I think you won't be surprised to hear me say that that, that we're really not going to answer hypotheticals in the future yet. Um, obviously, the Summit of the Americas is in April, um, and that's not a situation that we can answer, although I think we have made clear that we believe the summit process is committed to democratic governance, and you know we think that the governments that are sitting at that table ought to be committed to the summit principles, which include democratic governance, and therefore, that's our position at this point. Um, obviously, we have a position on Cuba which does not, at this point, see them as upholding those principles. Um, on ISIL, I think, you know, your, your comment about uh, those who have communication with Syria, I think, or with President Assad is interesting because it's very clear that there are some countries that still have a relationship with or communication with President Assad. I don't think, I don't really think that's the issue right now. Um, unfortunately, I think the way in which some of the commentary has been couched has been in support of President Assad. That is not obviously the position of the United States. Um, there are obviously and will be increasingly concrete things, I think, that the United States will know about how one can go about attacking, whether it's information about foreign fighters or financial links, and that's the kind of conversations that will be held in uh, diplomatic circles uh, and not things that will be discussed in public. Um, but I think the, the more that we are uh, pursuing this, um, the greater the information becomes and the more those conversations will be able to be specific. Um, but I think it is pretty clear as the United States engages with its allies the kinds of things that we hope they will be doing, as well as, by example, the things that the United States is doing um, in terms of financial systems and um, how we're going about 
uh, working together to ensure that foreign fighters don't have access to either the battlefield or the ability to go to other places um, to threaten other countries. Let's go now to Washington. Oh, your last question oh. was on the unaccompanied children. I, I would just say there is, ver there is money on the table, and you said it at the end of your question, which is there's $300 million in a supplemental that the President sought from Congress, and whether or not the Congress has acted, that is still very much the President's request. Uh, he believes that's critically important as a part of the supplemental uh, for us to be able to attack those root causes. In the absence of congressional action, um, we will do what we can to find funds uh, to increase our commitment and the ability to do what we can. We have already increased funds significantly to aid in return repatriation of uh, citizens from Central America and reintegration, uh, but there's no doubt that we need more, which is why the President sought those $300 million. Please go ahead now with your question from Washington. Uh, good morning, Madam Jacobson. Marta Avila with RCN TV Colombia. Uh, what's your opinion about President Santos' statement on Cuba? Uh, this uh, week uh, in New York, he said that uh, the U.S. must stop the economic embargo because it has failed. What's your opinion about that? And it is possible that the U.S. stop the embargo? I guess what I would say is that we have always had, will always have, the utmost respect for President Santos. He is obviously a very close ally, um, and we will continue to admire, respect, and support him in so much of what he does in Colombia and really in, in the world. As an example, this is one of those subjects on which we disagree. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, we do not believe that, uh, that uh, um, that he's correct in this in terms of, of changing the, the policy at this moment. But I would also say, and I think you know, we all have, have heard this, the President was very clear, President Obama was very clear recently when he talked about, in Miami, being creative in our Cuba policy. Um, there are things that can be done within the executive power, as the President has done, changing travel regulations, changing remittance regulations. I think that some of the things that have been done in terms of purposeful travel uh, to engage the Cuban people uh, by the American people um, have had a profound impact uh, in civil society on, uh, on Cubans. Um, and so I think the President is, is in fact made a commitment um, to trying to ensure that the Cuban people are not the ones who are hurt uh, by American policy. But but this is an area in which the President and President Santos may not see 100 percent eye to eye. We have time for just one more question. Hi, Mario from Record TV from Brazil. Um, Wednesday, President Dilma at the GA, she made some um, critics up about the offensive against ISIS. So I'd like to know if the U.S. has asked Brazil specifically any kind of support for the, the operations and if you can comment on what Brazil has said. And on a separate topic, uh, there was this issue that the uh, U.S. might not ask a tourist visa for Brazilians coming to visit the U.S. a few years ago, uh, and how that's going. Mm -hmm. Sure. On the first question, um, I can't tell you that there has been a specific conversation with Brazil about, you know, could you please do X and Y. Uh, the truth of the matter is that during this incredibly busy week, um, there have been some conversations that were programmed to happen and some conversations that have happened in hallways and some conversations that have happened at, you know, major luncheons that Ban Ki-moon had held or other global events. And so a lot of these conversations are taking place on the margins of other meetings. Um, so I can't be absolutely certain of whether, of whether uh, Minister Figueredo or, or others have had conversations with our officials, Secretary Kerry and others. What I can tell you is that the conversations about every country being able to do something in this fight are certainly going on. And so whether or not there have been specific asks of Brazil, which I don't, I, I don't know and I'm not sure there have been, um, certainly we are hopeful that every country can contribute in a country as large and important as Brazil, I think definitely does have a role to play here um, and can be helpful and supportive, and we hope they would be. Um, again, 
in the areas such as humanitarian uh, relief, where Brazil has played an important role in many other conflicts, um, and foreign fighters and financial uh, areas. So, so we're still, you know, hopeful on that. Um, on your second question, remind me where you were. Right, on the visa waiver program. <coughs> I didn't exactly prepare for that one today, so I can't tell you that I know exactly where we are, except that we continue to have a commitment to work with Brazil on this issue. We have a consular dialogue with Brazil, and we will continue to, you know, work with the Brazilian government. The Brazilian government continues to work towards meeting all of the requirements of our law, because they are stipulated by law. They're not a discretionary matter when we can get to a visa waiver program. Um, and we're optimistic that at some point in the future we can get there. We, as I think people know, want to encourage as many Brazilians to come visit the United States as we can. We are moving ahead on opening new consulates in Brazil. Uh, we have increased the number of consular officers who can adjudicate the demand for visas in Brazil as, as quickly as we can to meet that demand. We've driven down the amount of time Brazilians have to wait for a visa from something that was unacceptably long, numbers of weeks, to now uh, just a couple of days. Um, and we'll continue to make it as easy as possible, uh, hopefully someday ending in, in no visas at all. But we're not there yet, but we're continuing to work on that. Assistant Secretary, you've been very generous with your time. We have a few more questions, but I know you have a very tight schedule as well. Um, I probably can do one more. Okay, we have time for one more question. The gentleman in the back has been very patient. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, Edwin Giraldo with uh, Caracol Radio from Co Colombia. Um, another question regarding Colombia. Uh, President Santos said this week that he supports the idea of Venezuela becoming a member of the uh, United Nations Security Council. Uh, obviously, the United States doesn't like this idea. Um, what is your opinion on this uh, statement of President Santos? I think you just answered your own question. Um, it, we have. I think we've been also pretty clear about this one, that on the Security Council, we think the most important thing is that members of the Security Council be countries and leaders who um, take very seriously and implement and live by um, the principles, the commitments, the treaties, uh, the rules and regulations, if you will, of the United Nations, the international agreements and its underlying uh, principles. And so the requirements, if you will, for what we believe are um, good Security Council members are not uh, sort of country A versus country B. They're a, a type of um, criteria. Uh, that is more general than that, um, and to us means abiding by those principles, living them, upholding them, um, and being a responsible, committed member of the Security Council in behavior. So that's what we look for in Security Council membership, and, and we've made that clear um, going forward. So we'll have to, you know, see what happens moving forward. But but we have expressed, you know, that view of the type of member we like to see in the council. 